uh, 6.30. It's a hybrid meeting, which we're in person as well as in Zoom. For those that are on, watch, are we watch, is it live on cable? Yes. Yeah. For those that are on cable and want to uh, join via Zoom, I'll give you the meeting ID number, which is 834-7559-6773. Seven, Let me read that again. The meeting ID number is 834-7559-6373. And the passcode is 066630. Again, the passcode is 066630. My colleagues in the Board of Selectmen are meeting in person. Uh, Selectman Hall is present, no. as well as Dr. Z and uh, Ken Pacheco. Could we all stand for the Pledge of Allegiance? <laughs> To the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So the way uh, that we're going to do this, as you know, uh, we've talked about inviting uh, representatives from Bristol, Plymouth to come here to explain to the residents uh, what's going on with the new project that they're, they're going to have. And we'll be voting on this on March 5th from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. at the elementary school. So I've asked representatives from BP to come uh, and be present. We're going to let them speak. Uh, and then I'm, before I ask my colleagues to ask any questions, I want to let the public ask any questions that they wish to ask. Uh, and if your questions are answered and they were the same as ours, then we may not have any questions, but we may have some questions, but you'll have an opportunity first uh, to ask any questions. I would ask that you identify yourself, give us your address, and be respectful to the uh, representatives from Bristol uh, Plymouth. I would ask that the representatives from Bristol Plymouth, since we're on Zoom also, to identify yourselves. Okay, Alex Magley, superintendent. Uh, and thank you for having us here uh, a second time. It's uh, you know uh, for us to provide the information needed, um, make a, a more decision. And with us, uh, should I go by each one, or should I let you guys all introduce yourselves? I think I want you guys all introduce yourselves. How's that? Sure. Okay. Uh, go ahead, Chad. You're on mute, though. Anybody else? Yeah. All right, uh, so good evening. Thank you again for having us. Uh, my name is Chad Friedman. I'm a PMA consultant, the owner's project manager for the Bristol Plymouth uh, School District. With me from PMA, I have Sheena O'Connor, Sean Burke, and Megan Lamacchio. I'm going to let each one of the architect will come and introduce themselves. Thank you. Also, Ed, also Ed Ducho, representing the school committee from Dighton. Thank you. Uh, my video is not working, so. <laughs> That's all right. Some of us know what you look like. <laughs> uh, can everybody uh, can everybody hear them? Are you able to hear the presentation? I saw one of these. If you could just speak a little louder when you're talking. So who's going sure. to who's going to start? Let so, me just introduce the architects. So I have um, I'm Tina Stanislavski from H and F H Architects, and I also have Bobby Williams with me as well to present tonight. Okay. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Also, on the, and on the team is uh, I'm not sure if she's on there. Uh, Nadine Rose, our business man, administrator, yes. as well as uh, Margaret McLean from Unibank. Uh, the bonds person is also um, in case there's questions regarding some finances. Okay, thank you. I would just ask that as each person speaks to again to identify themselves. So who who wants to start the uh, the program? Can everybody see my screen? Uh, yes, we can. Yes. Yeah. Nice. Right. Thank you. Um, so I can kick it off. This is Chad Pritman with PMA Consultants. Um, so again, thank you all for joining us this evening. Um, I'll run through some, some information about the project and then we can open it up to questions and discussion afterwards. Uh, so a quick overview of the agenda. We're going to talk about uh, where we are and how we got here. We'll talk a bit about the existing facility. Uh, we'll talk about the MSBA process a little and then uh, the design, the schedule, uh, cost information and some voting information. I'm hearing an echo while somebody else is speaking. See, Ed Dutra, you have a lot of feedback. Can we uh, mute him? Yeah, yeah you can try to mute him. He's unmuting. We're going to mute you, Ed. I'm coming. All right, there we go. <laughs> 
Sorry, I think the background noise was cleared up a bit. Um, so let's talk. About, Thank you. We'll talk a moment about the road so far and project milestones. Uh, so this, this effort dates back over two years now. Uh, PMA joined the team back in 2019. And then uh, in 2020, HOFH came on board. Uh, throughout 2020 and 2021, we we're in the feasibility study of the Massachusetts School Building Authorities program. Uh, so three major steps there. The feasibility consists of two submissions to the state, the preliminary design program, which is a collection of all the options. We looked at over two different, uh, different study options. Then the next step where we submit to the state is called the preferred schematic report. And that's when you identify the preferred solution. We submit it again uh, to the state once it's been uh, approved by the school building committee and the school committee. And then uh, once the state's board agrees that that is the uh, most economical and most beneficial solution to move forward, they invite us to proceed in the schematic design. So that happened you know, early last year and we were in schematic design for most of last year. We went in front of the MSBA board again on October 27th and uh, they approved the project, they approved the project budget, uh, project scope, and our next step here is uh, the project funding authorization. And we have a vote upcoming scheduled for March 5th, which brings us here tonight. Uh, so I'm going to turn it over to each of the future and they can talk a bit about the existing facilities, some of the challenges, and some of the project goals. Great, thanks, Chad. So this is Tina Stanislavski taking over for Chad. Uh, from HMFH. So why are we here? Um, the existing building has a lot of uh, challenges. It was built in the early 70s um, and it has systems that have basically outlived their useful life. It's over 50 years old. Buildings built in the 70s um, are really difficult to renovate. They used um, materials that were sort of inexpensive at the time and um, you know they have low ceiling heights so and challenges with that. Anyway, so the building has energy efficiency challenges, there's hazardous materials in it like asbestos. Um, the systems, the mechanical, electrical, plumbing are all outdated and failing. The exterior envelope is failing. Um, but the real concern that the school has is that they're out of space. So when the building was built in the 70s, it was built for a population of about 700 students and they have almost double that in the building today. Um, some of the other challenges that they face, the codes that it was built under didn't include the accessibility ADA code, structural codes, um, seismic codes, um, but really the challenge that they have right now is that they have um, the, the need for more space. So next. So you can see some of the photos here, the finishes are failing, the floors are cracking, you can see the sinks are not accessible, um, there's issues with the envelope, the doors are old and leaking energy. Um, the security has an issue on the site, so they built some outbuildings to have some of the shops um, programs house in because they were out of space within the main building. So they have kids crossing over the, you know, the roadways and the parking lots to get to those buildings. So in today's uh, day and age, it's, it's better to have your kids all in one secure facility. And again, like I mentioned, there's some hazardous materials and flooring and insulation in the school. Uh, architects. As Tina mentioned, space constraints is one of the biggest challenges of the existing school. What we're showing here, um, everything in red, it became and now it is greater than 20% below the ESC Chapter 74 guidelines and MSBA state standards. Um, so what we're highlighting again, this is all one. We have the gymnasium, we have the collision, auto tech, electrical, carpentry. The cafeteria is too small. All of the science classrooms, when the school was originally built, um, there were science, but they, there was definitely science that was expanded. Um, so a lot of these existing classrooms were converted, and now the of science classrooms meet the SBA state standards. Um, so you can see that those are some of those real tight constraints that we're working with. Um, again, just kind of showing some photos to go with it. The undersized library, all the classrooms in the interior, um, don't have access to natural light. So it also is, it's, it's natural light is proven to, um, for, for students in, in good learning. Um, undersized gym with the accessibility issues. Again, the audit, so they have a smaller auditorium. Schools, typical high schools tend to have larger auditoriums that allow for larger trays to, um, to, uh, to get together. 
Um, the, this auditorium right now is mostly in the cafeteria where the stage is here. Um, inaccessible fitness spaces above, so that goes to the ADA that he was talking about. You can see that part of the reason they've been able to make things work within the school for now is they've been able to build um, second levels in electrical and plumbing, um, HVAC for extra storage. So they have made great use of their existing space, but you can see with all the equipment, um, having up to 40 students in these classrooms can be very challenging, and it's definitely a lot of work for the teachers to make sure they maintain that safe environment for their students. Some of the larger machine programs like CAD CAM, again, just showing the infrastructure and the, the amount of space um, limitations they have currently. Um, this is the culinary graphics, some metal fab. So again, this is just really talking to that um, space constraint issue within the current school. Um, in addition to that, uh, looking at the site plan challenges, um, there's two ways in, Route 140 and Upper Route 140 and also the Hart Street entrance over here. As you enter the building, there's very confusing site circulation. Well, right now, the, the buses and the parents have to go in the back in between the outbuildings and the existing. You can see you're going right by the receiving area. This is the first um, thing you see when you approach the building that's right next door to the, the culinary entrance. As you come around to the front, then you finally are made aware of the presence of the school. Um, so that's a big challenge. There's some wet areas within the school, so there's definitely um, challenges within the site. Um, and again, trying to find ways for those public facing programs that are so um, important to the school and to the community to be able to provide those services. There's just really um, poor signage and visibility for those. Turn back over to Tina. Hey, so when we um, started this, this project with the school after we did the existing facilities sort of study, we met with them and talked to them about what ideally would be in a new or renovated school. Um, some of the goals that uh, the administration, the educators um, came up with are one, to create a student hub by centrally locating the, the library and the cafeteria, um, to create vocational clusters, so the programs um, you know, like automotive would be together, the construction shops would be together. We have some diagrams to kind of outline what that means. They also wanted to have a connection between the educational and the vocational spaces. So the students in this program really learn by doing, and if they were connected more when they were in their math class to their vocational spaces and kind of understood why they were learning those types of things, there would be more success in the school. Um, so they wanted those transparency to happen between the shops and the corridors and those academic spaces. Uh, they wanted to increase the size of the labs and the vocational spaces. They also wanted to encourage the community to come and engage with the school. And that, you know, you've heard Bobby talk a little bit about how it's difficult to find those public facing programs now. So they wanted to create a way to really invite the public in, and let them know about cosmetology and culinary and all the other great programs they have. Um, they wanted to create small group areas for students and for SPED programs. That was something that was really never in the school when it was built. Um, and they wanted to create an auditorium for um, gathering for bigger groups of kids, for distance learning, and for the arts program. And they wanted an appropriately sized gym for wellness and extracurricular activities. Next. So you can see some of the ideas that we went through with them where you would have a hub with all the public spaces like the auditorium, the gym, the CAF, the library. Um, you would have those public service um, spaces out in front. You can see those in purple. And then you would have these wings that would have sort of the clusters of the tech spaces along with the academic. So these are some of the vocational clusters that we talked about. Um, the service cluster would have things like culinary, cosmetology, graphics, marketing, and childcare, all public access spaces together. Um, and you can read some of the other ones. You know, there'd be a manufacturing and engineering cluster, a construction cluster, a transportation cluster, a health cluster, and a business cluster. And then there would be an appropriate separation of public versus private spaces in the new school so that they could invite the public into an event in a gym or the CAF, and they wouldn't necessarily have access to all of the academic spaces within the school. And so this is sort of a snapshot of the MSBA spreadsheet where we build the sizes of the different programs. And this is in here to let you know that the school is really designed in a way that uh, 
creates equity across the state. So MSBA sort of tells us what size things like the gymnasium should be in a school with this many students, how many classrooms they should have, what size those classrooms are. And then the DESC um, tells us what the minimum sizes are for the vocational programs. So it's all very prescribed uh, process that we go through to right size every space in the building. This is just to let you know that we're not overbuilding, we're right sizing every space in the new building. Yeah. Um, so now I want to give a little bit of an overview of the next part of the feasibility study. Um, this is where we really start to investigate options. Um, as part of the MSBA program, we have to first start with a base repair option. This is the option where we look at no educational upgrades to the school. It's purely bringing it up to code, um, th not, um, fixing all those units that Tina was mentioning in the beginning, and really just bringing an existing building back to code. Um, it doesn't increase the size, it doesn't, it doesn't provide anything else, but it, it just brings it to code. Then we look at a renovation addition option, and we look at new construction options. Um, as part of this, we also are studying three different enrollments. Um, the current enrollment's around 1,300, so we studied that. That got increasing around 1,434, and we also looked at increasing to 1,540. Um, the increase in enrollment was primarily looked at by looking at what the most popular programs are, so the school would have the ability to expand those types of programs that provide more offerings for the students. Um, so in the end, after studying all of these, Every time we did a renovation addition option, we studied all three enrollments. Every time we did a new construction, all three enrollments. So we ended up with probably about almost 20 different studies, um, again, to really make sure we're, we're getting to the right solution. So starting with the base repair, again, this was looking at the existing school, um, replacing doors, windows, upgrading the back. Happens. You know, none of, the, none of the bathrooms, not for some, but not all, were accessible. So there's some significant renovations there. Um, structural upgrades, the whole facade, the exterior, hazmat, abatement. All of this would have to be done while the students are in the school. Um, the price tag of this came in around $137 million. And it was going to take upwards of eight years to complete. Um, the next one is looking at a phase renovation. We said how much of the existing school can we maintain while adding two new wings to it? Um, again, we were able to, to come up with some scenarios where there's a lot of phasing, but again, this was around an eight-year project as well because you would essentially build new, have to move the program into the space, and then go and start to renovate the core of the building um, to, to complete this. We then looked at, is there a way where we can keep that existing gym? You know, is there parts of the building we can maintain? Um, that gym was kind of a standalone, so we, we kept that and we built a new school around it. Um, so that was an option we studied. Again, at each of these options, we studied three different enrollments. Um, and then we looked at two different new construction options. One, sitting on the existing football field, and then another more centrally located within the space um, highlighting. From there, we took all of those vision goals um, and other criteria that the school building committee came up with, and we start to evaluate each of those options. B, the innovation, C, the addition renovation, and D, the new construction. You can see C and D were very close in terms of meeting the educational programming and all the needs. So then what we do next is we start to evaluate them also by cost. And that, I believe Chad is going to, oh, we're going to talk a little bit more about this next part of this process and then um, we'll get into more of the numbers. Yeah, so thanks, Bobby. So we looked at all of those options and all of the costs, and it ended up that the new um, option of putting a building on the football fields, like you see here, was um, the best educationally and the best financially. Um, this option was also chosen by the MSBA, so at each different submission phase, the MSBA would approve us to move forward with three options, with two options, and then finally with one option at the end, which is this option that we're showing you here. Um, so you can see that in the foreground, the new fields, that's where the existing building sits today. So the new building would be built while the existing building remains functioning and the students are in the school, so we don't have to have modular classrooms. Once the new building is built, that existing building would be torn down and the new fields would be rebuilt. 
You can see that we're keeping some of the roadways that are existing, we're keeping the two entrances to the site and a lot of the existing parking to try to minimize costs. Next. So here's the new site plan in a little bit more detail. You can see that out in front of the new school, we're putting in a new football field and running track along Route 24. Um, we are providing a loop road all the way around the new school for safety and security. Um, this uh, layout on the site will allow for buses to come in one of the entrances and drop off students and loop out. And it'll also allow for parents to come in on the other entrance and drop off kids and loop out. So we're hoping to segregate those two um, different types of drop off and pick up sequences. Uh, you can see that there's outdoor workspace along the wooded edge um, at the top of the screen. Those are all the automotive and construction shops that have outdoor work areas. So they're gonna have secure areas in the back of the school to do that work outside that they need and also to keep the site sort of clutter free. Okay, we can go on to the next. And we have some floor plans of the new facility and the colors represent the different clusters that we were talking about for the vocational. The purple is the service cluster. So when you come in off of Route 140, you'll see culinary, cosmetology, graphics, and then the early childhood education. So there'll be visitor parking there and really clear signage. Um, if you're coming to the site for one of those programs, you'll know exactly where you're going. Uh, the green is the administration, and that's adjacent to the main entrance for the students. They'll come in in the front of the building there. Um, the other uh, vocational clusters are automotive, as I was saying, in the back, and then the construction uh, wing is back there. We have metal fab, and then in the front we have the engineering cluster. The orange spaces are the academic spaces adjacent to all those vocational shops, and they sort of function around that nice courtyard space in the center. Um, they all have windows and they'll have access to outdoor classrooms. And we know that during the pandemic, it was really important to have access to outdoor educational space. Um, the yellow area is the hub that we've been talking about for the goals. And you can see this a little bit more. You can go ahead to the next one, Bobby. You can see this a little bit more on the second floor. There's the auditorium upper level, the media center library, and the gymnasium. So we tried to stack as much as we could in the school. Vocational schools are challenging because you wanna have ground access for many of the vocational shops. So um, in the school, we're putting the gymnasium upstairs, uh, which works really well. And then we have the marketing and business cluster in purple. And then we have the health cluster in the front of the building. And again, all of the orange is the academic spaces. So this is just a three-dimensional um, view of the building. You can see it's really quite large. We're working on sort of breaking down the different clusters in their own sort of shapes to break down that massing. So you have a nice experience when you're walking on site next to this big building. Um, next. And then we've been doing some studies of the main entrance. The building will have durable materials like brick and stone, um, nothing elaborate, but something that's gonna last more than 50 years. And we have a full year of design that we're moving into after this. Hopefully when the boat passes, we'll um, work more on some of the exteriors. And you can go ahead to the next one. And we also want to let you know that um, it will be a sustainable building. We are looking at ways to green the building as much as possible. And when we talk about um, you know, a green building, we think about energy, ways to reduce the energy. We're gonna have LED lighting, an efficient exterior envelope. Um, hopefully green energy sources like PV um, and also EV charging stations for cars. Health and well-being is really important. We want to have positive indoor air quality and acoustics. We want to have thermal con control and comfort for our occupants. Again, important access to light and views. Every space will have windows. Um, and we want to make sure we're using materials that are healthy and recycled and locally produced. We want to reduce water consumption manage the storm water on site. Again, we have a lot of wetlands, so we want to take care of those areas um, and find ways to reuse the rainwater. Um, and in terms of waste, we're going to try to uh, minimize the construction waste and emphasize, you know, recycling, composting, and waste management on the site. I think I'm going to turn it over to Chad now, and he can talk to you a little bit about uh, the grant and reimbursement information. Thank you, Tina. 
so looking a bit in across um, the three bars that you have here in front of you are the three submissions that go to the MSBA. So this is what the preferred solution or what eventually ended up turning into the preferred solution across at each of those three submissions to the state. Uh, back at preliminary design, when it was just a collection of options, it was $325 million. A preferred schematic report, and the option was moved forward and approved at that time, it was $317 million. The final approved value uh, on October 27th from the MSBA board was $305 million. That's the number we've been working with. Uh, those cost reductions were largely possible due to a, a reduction in the overall building size, and then also just looking at uh, ways to make the floor plan more efficient. So we stack spaces as much as possible by having a two-story space to reduce our, our foundation and our roofing costs. Um, you can't have a four-story building, unfortunately, because it's a vocational school, so you need that ground level access for things like shops and uh, automotive and, and all these programs. Um, so driving down a bit further into that $305 million total project cost, uh, the MSBA program is very, very specific in what it will reimburse, uh, and it reimburses up to certain caps. Uh, so the district's reimbursement rate is 62.25% of eligible costs. Um, what that breaks down to is a MSBA reimbursement projection of $125.5 million. We call that a projection because it's based on every single penny in that budget line by line being expended. Um, historically, that does not happen. That's certainly not pen, uh, but we need to have project contingencies, especially in this current uh, the current market we're in right now, material supplies and, and labor. Uh, so what that breaks down to is a district share of $179.9 million. And then it's important to note that uh, the, that cost is broken up amongst the seven member communities based upon enrollment. So uh, each year, the bill might fluctuate a little bit. Historically, it doesn't move too much. Um, but based on the percentage of students that that community has enrolled in the school, that is their uh, allocated percentage of the, that year's borrowing cost. Um, so important to understand uh, really where the market is right now. Uh, so looking into the MSBA's pipeline, there are four very, very similar in that there are large vocational schools in the pipeline right now. Uh, those four projects are on the screen right, here right now. You'll see that Bristol Point of Tech at $524 is the lowest cost of all those large vocational schools in the MSBA's pipeline. Um, so it is a big school. Uh, it is a big number. We realize that and we will continue to do everything within our power to get that cost down as much as we possibly can as we work through this, uh, this final year of design. Uh, so the construction escalation, this is something that we are, we are constantly fighting. So this is uh, this is a look back at this point. This truck goes back 15 years. Um, so you can really just kind of insert a line of best fit there. And 15 years ago, construction costs were in the range of $250, $300 a square foot. Um, unfortunately, that's not where we are today. A lot has changed in the past 15 years. And if you follow that trend line up, um, you kind of we're on your eye to the $574 mark. Where Bristol Plymouth is on the far right in the blue is we are one of the most current projects. We're right in that line of best fit. Keep in mind, this chart is everything in the MSBA's pipeline. This includes elementary schools. It includes schools that might not have a, a large site or parking requirements, or maybe they don't have an existing building to abate and demolish. Uh, so we're lumped in on a cost per square foot with all these other projects that might not have as many challenges. And maybe, honestly, some of them might have uh, even greater challenges. Um, but where we are right now is uh, we're, we're in the middle of the pack. This is not an expensive school. And if you look at the vocational schools, we're at the uh, least expensive end of it. Big projects so expensive. We acknowledge and uh, understand that. Um, so the next step for us, once we have that MSBA board approval, is um, we gear up for this vote that's about to happen on March 5th. Uh, part of that involves developing a, a very detailed project cash flow. So we take the project schedule to the next level to look at when we're going to have major expenditures for things like steel or mechanical units arriving on site in order to support that schedule. Uh, we take that and we map it against the detailed line item cost estimates and we project it out over time. Not only are we doing that on a month-to-month -month basis, but we're also looking at what is potentially eligible for MSBA reimbursement 
and when the district might expect to see an MSBA reimbursement as they do reimburse on a monthly basis as costs are expended. Uh, this is very, very important because it helps us uh, inform what the, the district's borrowing needs are at any point in time. The district does not need to borrow the full $305 million. They only need to borrow the amount of money that they need to support the construction schedule and project cash flow needs. So this information is provided to the district's financial advisors and they put together a borrowing plan, which is represented by the next slide. And uh, hopefully this is familiar information. Um, so tax impact projection, this is something we touched on last time we met with uh, the Brighton community. There's still no change from that time. We're still in the same numbers. Uh, so the FY 2021 single family home, the average value in Brighton is $351,669. Uh, on that average single family home, you can expect a quarterly tax impact of $60.29. So that's an annual tax impact of $241.14. Um, this is based upon last, uh, the FY 2021 student enrollment of EP. Uh, so subject to very minor fluctuations, but uh, this, this should give you a sense of what to expect as far as cost for this project. Uh, so on to project schedule and next steps. Uh, very, very good picture. Um, March 5th, we have the, the vote. If uh, the funding is authorized to move the project forward, we have roughly one year of design. And then we move into the procurement phase. So pre-qualifications could begin as uh, soon as the end of this year and then final contract awards next spring. Uh, that time's up for a phase one construction schedule uh, beginning right around July of next year. And the overall construction is about three years for the main building. And then we would move into the uh, second phase, and that second phase is abatement and demolition of the existing building. And then we complete the final side improvements, the fields, sidewalks, parking, uh, so on and so forth. And then that would be scheduled to be wrapped up uh, by the fall of 2026. Of the student occupancy would occur in September 2026 of the new building. Check so over the next slide. Uh, so, some information about the uh, upcoming vote. Uh, so, the vote is Saturday, March 5th at 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. Uh, the deadline to register the vote, I believe, is uh, February 11th to check with your each individual community, but I believe they all are using the same date. So, um, of course, the yes vote moves the project forward. Uh, so you're looking at a district share of, of that $179.9 million, and that's what based upon enrollment. Um, in the event of a no vote, the, the district still does have needs for their building uh, in the short term. There are systems that are failing, there are envelope components that are failing, there are accessibility upgrades that need to happen. Um, there is a, a cost of that's been fully developed, it was presented to the state. And uh, the state declined to support that because the building is vastly underpriced. Uh, so the estimated cost of that solution, the repairs, sort of a um, uh, have to happen over time. Yeah, that is an eight-year schedule. It could be longer. It could be uh, shorter if there's somehow a way to vacate that building, which is not likely. Uh, but that cost is estimated to be 137 million dollars to the member communities. Uh, and of course, that keeps the building as existing size, 203,000 square feet, so it does not address the, uh, the overcrowding concerns that prompted the MSBA to invite the project into their pipeline in the first place. We can jump over to the next slide. Uh, so vote locations for Dighton, your voting location is where you usually vote at the Dighton Elementary School, uh, 1250 Somerset Island in Dighton. And then, uh, of course, for additional project information and updates, please follow along with us uh, on the Facebook page. There's an Instagram page, and then the project website is updated on a near daily basis. Uh, so for the latest and greatest and most accurate information, please uh, take a look there. You can contact us directly with any questions. We're happy to answer any questions folks might have. Um, that concludes our presentation. So uh, again, thank you very much for your time. Uh, I'll turn it back to the chair and uh, he can facilitate any uh, discussion or questions. Thank you. Thank you for your uh, presentation. Before I ask those that are on Zoom, if you have any questions, I'm gonna ask anybody in public who wishes to come to the uh, podium, uh, please give your name and address. And uh, like I said before, be respectful. Are there any questions from anybody in the audience? Ms. Hershey.
Good Thanks. evening. Um, my name is Jessica Hershey of uh, address. 2440 Chestnut Street here in Dighton. And um, I wanna thank BP for this presentation. I think it was very well done. Um, and it clearly, uh, you know, speaks to the, the detail, you know, like that the district already does such a fantastic job, you know, like with their education. Um, my husband and I, we have a freshman at BP and we can't say enough about the school and the program. Um, you know, we're very thrilled about the idea of this project ourselves. Um, I, just a couple of questions for clarification. Um, I was hoping that um, you could um, explain how the voting is working. Um, my understanding is that it's an aggregate vote, you know, like, which would mean that it isn't based only on how Dighton votes, um, you know, whether or not Dighton passes it on our on our town's behalf, um, but that all of the votes would be combined with all of the other sending towns. Um, so there's that question. And then my other question is if you could just clarify that if it's a yes vote that Dighton would um, have their percentage of um, the 179 million, I believe, um, that um, would be uh, you know, after the MSBA, you know, like has their components of it. And if it's a no vote that we would still have a component of the $137 million, if I believe, um, you know, like for repairing the building regardless. Did you hear those questions? We did, yeah. Uh, Alex, do you want me to take both of those? Yes, Captain. Uh, was on mute. No problem. Um, so the first question, um, how the vote works, so yes, you are correct. It is a combined total across all seven member communities. Uh, so simple majority, when you add up all those seven communities' votes together, um, would mean the project moves forward. The yes vote means it moves forward, and then a no vote, of course, means that, uh, that at this phase, we're, we're stopped. Um, the second part of that question, the yes vote, uh, you are correct, would mean that the district is authorized to borrow uh, their share of the project cost estimated at $179 million, and that uh, Dighton would be responsible for a repayment of the principal and interest borrowing costs uh, of that amount on an annual basis. And a no vote, uh, you're also correct, the, the building absolutely needs uh, repairs, it needs maintenance. Uh, the estimated cost is $137 million, uh, if not next year or the year after. Um, it's, it's not going to last forever before that cost becomes very real, and unfortunately, that cost, as we saw with escalation, was increased on that basis. So, great questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So, regardless, Dighton would be contributing some money, at, like within the upcoming years, and you know, like those choices are either putting money at an old building or putting money towards a new building. That's correct. Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions from? That's good. You want to come up, please? <coughs> Just give your name and address. Yes, sir. Good evening. Thank you very much. My name is Paul Reynolds of 725 Main Street. Um, I am the father of three young children who I frankly hope get into BP. I've heard consistently fantastic things about the quality of education there. However, if they don't get into BP, then I want to ensure that they still have access to a quality education. And that can only be secured if large expenditures and major projects such as this one are done equitably and responsibly. And I feel that that can only occur if we have a frank discussion about what are genuine, authentic needs of the schools and what is something that would just frankly be nice to have. Um, one of the things that I heard earlier in the presentation was that the school was originally built for approximately 700 students. However, several of the shops have built new levels and outbuildings and some other things. So when we talk about the capacity increase, since there has been some, um, some, some kind of pressure valve building, so to speak, to, uh, to, to take off some of the overcrowding, it doesn't necessarily seem like the increased capacity is truly an apples to apples comparison. Um, another issue that I wanted to discuss was that I believe it's very important to differentiate wants from needs when we're talking about major programs. And when I hear things such as, um, to, I copied from the slide, to 
encourage community engagement with an, out, with an inviting facility or to install EV chargers in front of the school. Um, when we're talking about a long-term project that's going to have a lasting fiscal impact on the health of our communities, especially in the, in the wake of the requirements of the other schools in our districts, um, when you look at all of the students that are in the, the combined district, BP only is able to accept, obviously, uh, a minority of the students that attend. And so one question that I would have would be, uh, to what extent were the, the expenditure needs of the other schools in the dis district considered when formulating this proposal? Um, because I, I, I want to make sure that this is done equitably and that the students that don't go to BP still have access to a quality education and a quality facility. Um, additionally, a question that I had was of the amount of money that is being financed, and perhaps this would be a good question for the, um, the representative from Utabank, what would be the interest expense long term for that, uh, that financed capital, and is that included in that $305 million figure? Who wants to respond? That's quite, quite the handle, but, but I, yeah, I think I'm going to turn it over first to Unibank. Uh, is Margaret on, on, the, on there and explain kind of the, the borrowing? Yeah, I'm here. Okay. Um, so to answer your question, no, the $305 million is just the total principal cost. It does not include any interest on the borrowing. Um, projected interest varies over the life of the issue 30 years. So the average rate that we use um, you see the borrowing is split out into two schedules, one being the bulk of it up front in the earlier years to take advantage of the interest rates. And then the last piece will come in after the final MSB audit. So it'll include the district's final share so that you don't over borrow. Um, average coupon was about, three, about 372 on the first issue, 375 on the second issue. Yeah, he has some other concerns too. Okay. Someone want to respond to his other concerns? Mr. Reynolds? Remind them. Mr. Reynolds, you want to come up again and just uh, ask those questions singularly? Uh, singularly, <laughs> I guess. One at a time. Hang on, Mr. Almeida. Take it away. I can probably see you. Uh, <laughs> um, yes, just, just to, to restate that when we consider the, the scope of the project and some of the things that are being, um, that are being proposed. Some of them, um, you know, certainly there are, um, you know, there are authentic needs that the school has, um, as do many in the district. However, when there are some things that seem to be in the proposal that are, um, that genuinely appear to my eye to be more of things that are, that are wants more than needs, were the financial needs of the other schools in the district considered relative to what the district share would be for this project? Um, you know, as, as, I, as I said, I wanted to make sure that we have a, an equitable distribution of the education dollars that we have. Our communities are only capable of funding so many projects for so many children. And as BP is, is not able, obviously the majority of students are not able to attend BP. So my concern is to make sure that we have enough available dollars to make the necessary investments in the other facilities that are servicing the rest of our children. So my question is if the needs of the other schools in the district were considered in this proposal. Yes, I'm a little confused by the needs of other schools because we're concentrating on BP. So I'm a little, I guess I'm confused with your question. And when you, you mean, uh, you know, some things that seem, can you give us examples of what you, you know, what you feel is? A, a few, a few that, that jumped out in, in the proposal, as, as I said, were that we have things that are being listed as goals, such as encouraging community engagement with an inviting facility, installing EV chargers, mm -hmm. and um, mm -hmm. there were just some items in there that, that seem like they're not necessarily um, needs of the school, just kind of things that would be nice to have. I can only, I can only go by what you give me. So uh, um, with all due respect, the, 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 when we talk about inviting the community, our students learn from working with the community. Just like that podium are in right now, our students built that for you. The, 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 you know, so we do things for our community. We have culinary, we want, we want to invite them. The only way they get the hands on is by doing real live work. 
So, you know, that's what we are, that's what we do now. So it's not any different than we, we have it. It just happens to be all the same, kind of the same spot, uh, more easy access, and, and also for the purposes of safety, things that we can lock things up with right now, our, our, you know, it's very wide open. Um, and so that's one of the things. Now, as far as those EV chargers and, uh, and, and the green stuff, those are only things that you know, actually give us uh, percentage points to, to support that. And um, the percentage we got from the MSBA, I think it was in the 58% reimbursement. But because of some things we've done in the school and the maintenance of the school, they gave us actually extra um, percentages for, for what we do. Um, so that's, you know, that's kind of a, you know, a reward for us because we've done things the right way. Uh, we've always been uh, fiscally responsible for the towns, uh, you know, so I, I kind of need examples of what is in that building that you, you, you know, you think that's uh, a luxury besides, I guess, it's a new building, um, and an updated facility. But, you know, as we go into the 21st century with our vocational schools, the, the, the equipment is changing. Um, and, 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 and so, so, the, so it's, not, it's, it's not easy to change with the shops that we have now. So I, I guess I, I have to, I, I need more examples of what you mean by um, luxuries. Can I just add a couple of things? I think that was really good, Superintendent. Um, some of the things you heard me talking about that you just reiterated there, you know, if you were going to plan a new school, if that's the direction that the MSBA is sending us and they're saying this is the option that we think is, you know, responsible fiscally and educationally, then you want to take time and plan that school for the future. So some of the things I was saying, you know, we sat down and met with the educators and we met with the students and the community and we understood like, what would be an ideal school for you in the future? If we're going to spend this money, if we're going to invest, what can we do to plan that school in a way that it'll be good for the next more than 50 years so we don't have to do this again? So some of the things like you were saying, having the, um, the public into the school, like the superintendent said, we try to emulate the spaces that those students will be working in in the future within the school so they can really get that training firsthand. You know, so the culinary program should really look like, you know, a state-of-the-art restaurant. So when they're cooking and they're serving, you know, that sort of prepares them for their future. Um, so in the EVs charging stations that I mentioned, those are some of our, you know, big picture goals. But if you think about you're educating the workforce of the future and you want them to understand what green energy is, what clean energy is, we're all signed on to the climate bill. So, you know, I think we should be teaching this next generation of students you know, how, what an EV charging station is, how do we service it, how do we install it, you know, same thing for electric cars, all of these things are changing in the future, and these spaces in the school have to really change to serve all of us, I think. I understand that. Thank you very much. I think my my concern is the spirit of my concern, just to, to rephrase, is that a dollar spent at BP is a dollar that is not spent at another school in our district. And while there are going to be long-term needs that other schools have, that is the um, that is what I'm referring to when I say that um, you know equity in education is very important to me, and making sure that we're being wise with the dollars that we spend because we truly don't have enough money in any of our communities to do all of the investment in every school that everybody would like. Right? There are things that are that we need to to address things that are on a need basis, and there are. I, that was the concern that I wanted to raise is that it seemed that with constructing a new facility that there are things that are that are not quite as much on the need side that I just get worried are going to be uh, contributing to those funds not being available for other schools that do also have authentic needs in the future. This, this, this was an opportunity in, in that, you know, we, we, we apply for every grant possible. That's why, you know, we've always been charging our, our district's minimum contribution. We, we apply for every grant we can. We, we buy our materials, our, our equipment for every, you know, with, with grant money. This was an opportunity for us to uh, apply. Now, I have no control when MSBA decided to take us on, uh, you know, to give us this $125 million grant opportunity to, for a facility. Uh, it could have been down, the, you know, a couple of years ago. I don't know if that was a good time. It could be five years from now. I don't know if that's going to be a good time. So I just apply for these, these grants. The opportunity is here that we have $125 million to, uh, so when we say $305 million, 
technically it's not three hundred five million. It's a three hundred five million dollar project uh, building that you're going to get for uh, one hundred eighty million, right? And, and again, I don't want to minimize the, the the amount of money. It's a lot of money, but it, it, you know what I'm saying is this is an opportunity we have. We're here because we've got a, a huge grant uh, to build a facility, and that's why we're here. Thank you. Anybody else in the audience that wishes to uh, speak? Just identify yourself, give us your address. Hello, Bill Moore, Smith Street um, in Dighton. Uh, I'd like to take exception to the last statement that you just made. Uh, grant money is our money. Uh, this project costs $300 million. It does not cost $180 million. And as was mentioned earlier, uh, we are not even counting the uh, interest on this debt. With the interest on this debt, the 180 million comes close to 300 million. Uh, what my friend was trying to say is that if we were to build a similar school here in Dighton, we, we belong to Dighton Rehoboth School District, and uh, I believe we have approximately 300 high school students. So if we were to try to build a similar school for our high school students, and Dighton Rehoboth School District needs upgrading just like everyone else, we'd be spent, th this project is a 5% increase on our taxes, 5% on pretty much all the communities around here. So if, if we were to build a similar school for Dighton Rehoboth, we'd have to add an additional 15%. Um, I don't think the costs of this project have been, have been thought of in terms of the impact to the communities around us uh, or the communities that, that are part of this project. Um, a couple questions I would have. So, so can you answer the question of, um, am I correct that there are about 1,331 students currently enrolled at Bristol Plymouth? True or false? There's about 1,300 students enrolled at UP, yes. And the, this project is going to be uh, 1,434 students, correct? That's the, uh, that's the, that's the uh, more, more into this form, yes. So that is a net raise of about 100 students. Um, is, do you aware of how long the waiting list is to get into BP? The waiting list? Yes. How long? How, how many kids um, want to get into the school? We had, our last check, we had about roughly about 120 students still on the waiting list. I, I believe I've heard the statement before that about 750 students applied last year. Is that correct? That's correct. So this is what happens. So we um, we take in roughly, depending on where our grades are as far as the seniors, because they all kind of mix in in the shops. You know, we take about 350, 360 students um, per year. There's about 700 applicants. But like any other, any just because you've got an applicant, that's 700 applicants. They're not necessarily people that are all, you know, all want to be there. They apply. There's some that don't want to be there, and then there's some when we, we call them back. They don't want to come. And right now, to this day, we have about 120 students uh, still on the waiting list that could possibly come in uh, either in the, this year or even because we take them in up to sophomore year. Uh, and because once sophomore year starts, then, then we, we can't take them anymore because they lost time on it in that shop area. So right now, uh, is it, there's a 120. So I think there's a misconception. There's a 700 students waiting list. There's no 700. We do not have 700 students in the waiting list. I can guarantee you that. I feel like we may be splitting hairs on definitions here or something because my math says if you've got 700-ish students that apply and you only got 300-ish students that actually get in, that means you said no to about 400 kids, give or take. Uh, that's nowhere near the number you're claiming for a waiting list. So the follow-up question would be, is this $305 million going to eliminate the waiting list? Are we, as every student that wants to get into BP, are they going to get in there? Well, no, they're not going to, not everybody's going to get in there. No. I mean, we, we, the, the MSDA gave us an option of about 1,500 students. But we, you know, 1,500 students, and that just is one to that, that, you know, to that, you know, you know, you got, you know you're, the price is higher. So if you had 1,500 students, it would have been higher. No, no, I'm talking about this project. This project is saying, we're going to add 100, 100 student capacity, and we're not going to eliminate the waiting list. Um, so it's not really going to serve that many more students. And well, according to my numbers here, like I said, I have 100 students on the waiting list. If I would. So next year, so so when the school is built, you're going to promise that every student that wants to go there is going to be allowed in. No, I'm not promised that. No, that was my point. Um, okay. 
Uh, so you, we're not going to provide for significantly more students. Um, everything I've ever heard, even, even these fine people here tonight, um, is VP is a fabulous school. It does great. All the kids that graduate there are doing very well. So I would say you're one of the best schools right now. So I don't think building a, a bigger, fancier school is going to give these kids a better education because they're already getting a great education. I'm also disappointed that there is a, um, there's a rebuild option, repair option that the towns were never given a chance to even explore. Um, it seems to me that the goal from, from this group here was to get that state money. Um, and that if any plan that didn't involve getting money from the state, you threw away. Because right now, we got $180 million coming from the towns when in your project, you've, your proposal, you actually show there is an option that you could have repaired the existing school for significantly less than that. According to your estimate that we haven't had any chance to debate, $137 million. I personally would guess that we could probably get that number well down as well. So I'm disappointed. I'm sorry, that wasn't a question. It's more of a statement. I'm disappointed that uh, we were not given th that opportunity. So thank you very much for your time. Anybody else in the audience that wishes to uh, ask a question? If not, I'm going to ask if anybody on Zoom wishes to ask a question. <clears throat> yes, I'm uh, Rudy from uh, Taunton. Ask your question, please. Uh, yes, I know. I'm not sure if this is uh, per, 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 pertaining to all the cities and towns, but I was wondering once, if, or I should say, if this is, is approved, when would it start to increase our real, uh, real, real estate tax? Can someone answer that question, please? Chad, is that something for you? Uh, I can pull it up, and I think we saw Margaret on. Yeah, I can. So um, ideally, you know, it depends on the actual major impact won't be probably to at least 2025, which is when the first bond payment would hit. There'd be some smaller interest payments on short-term debt that would be borrowed, but nowhere near as significant as the first principal and interest payment, which is projected at this point to be 2025. Okay, and. Um, yeah, but to, I understand that uh, uh, the once the in increase does occur, is that for uh, thir uh, thirty years or, or or not? Yeah, it's for thirty years. Is there some type of mechanism in in place that would um, track the uh, fluctuation of? Uh, property valuation, or is, or is that up to each individual city and town? I'm not really sure, sure what you're asking. I mean, each city and town tracks the valuation over time. You're saying projecting out going forward? Yes. Well, you're limited, you know, you're Assessed valuation can't increase more than two and a half percent each year, so that would kind of be the driver behind it. Okay, um, and uh, what I was wondering also is, uh, and this is probably probably uh, pertains more to individual cities and towns, but is there any type of uh, break or um, process? to help out the elderly and or anyone on a fixed in income? Yeah, that's something you'd have to go directly to each community for. Okay, thank you very much. Anybody else on Zoom wishes to ask a question? You could. Is there someone who wishes to ask a question, please? Like James Dupont would like to ask a question. Uh, if, uh, yeah, I'm not sure of my audio there. We can hear yes. you. All right. Uh, just to identify myself on the record, my name is James Dupont. I reside at 118 Elm Street, Eastern Rainham. Uh, I served on the Bridgewater Rainham Regional School Committee for 18 years and was selected in the town of Rainham for nine. Uh, I had the 
obvious distinction of serving one year on both boards. There was a question asked earlier about needs of other schools, and I think that's an appropriate question. But I have to say, as someone who was a selectman for a period of time and a regional school committee member, that the educational needs of Raynham and Bridgewater were very similar to how being met the same way that Dighton and Rowe would meet them, that they were met through the Dighton, the Bridgewater-Raynham Regional School Committee, not the Board of Selectmen. But it's a fair question to ask, and my experience was, and I'll yield to the superintendent on this one, but in my years at Bridgewater-Raynham, we had very close coordination with Bristol Plymouth, particularly in the subject that another gentleman brought up about placements. There was always a waiting list. There was a waiting list the day it opened. There will always be a waiting list. There is, if you, there's just too much demand for it, whereas, and because it's basically a selective process of admission to Bristol Plymouth, unlike Dighton, Rehoboth, or Bridgewater-Raynham, at the academic high schools, you show up and you're there, and the school has to deal with you. Vocational education is not structured that way. You have a set number of placements that your town is allowed, and each town, Raynham was as guilty of it as Dighton is. We always had more people wanting to go than there were slots available for the towns of Bridgewater and Raynham, but the larger question of educational needs is, I think, a fair one, but I don't think it's anything the Board of Selectmen necessarily addressed, because those questions are, in fact, resident with and decided by the Dighton, Rehoboth Regional School Committee for education generally, and then the Bristol Plymouth Vocational School District specifically is there to address the vocational needs, which are not necessarily the same as the non-vocational needs of the K-12 system at Dighton, Rehoboth, and we have a K-12 system at Bridgewater, Raynham. The other thing I wanted to say is that the gentleman asked, why did the repair option not get considered, and the fact of the matter is, and I studied the application process very extensively, the way it works is you have to, in making your initial application, you have to identify needed, there's your word, needed repairs and replacements, and those, once they are identified, are not reimbursable, so that if you ask why that wasn't presented, MSBA does not cover repair costs, but you have to give them a list of what you want that you believe needs to be repaired and replaced, and then they expect you to do it, and if you don't do it, whether you're Bridgewater, Raynham, Dighton, Rehoboth, or Bristol, Plymouth, they can withhold state aid to your city, to your member town, so the repair option was not presented for debt exclusion because it's not eligible for debt exclusion, and it's not eligible for reimbursement, so I'm not sure if that addresses the gentleman's question, but the debt exclusion applies to capital improvement, not repair, but if you do the, once you identify the repairs, and you put them into a larger capital project, those repairs are then eligible for the same reimbursement as the larger project, so the question is, would you rather pay the 134 million in repairs, 100% from local taxes, or would you rather have them subsidized 40%, so, but I want to thank the chairman and the superintendent, who's been very helpful to me in getting information, and thank you as well for your time. Is there anybody else on Zoom that wishes to ask a question? Anybody else on Zoom that would like to ask a question, please? If I could add one thing for what the gentleman just said, I'd like to 
Yes. Um, so uh, along that theme, main of thought of addressing other district needs. Um, so this is something that uh, is actively ongoing. Uh, over in Bridgewater, the Mitchell School is, is under construction now through the MSBA. Uh, Middleborough High School just recently opened uh, under an MSBA project. The Taunton Mulcahy School is very recent, another MSBA project. Uh, in Berkeley, the community school was invited into the pipeline, so hopefully they'll have a project that's funded by the MSBA shortly. Um, Dayton or Holbeth uh, is actually not, they have not submitted a statement of interest in 2020 or 2021. Uh, that period's closed, but that would be the, the mechanism to, to get into that MSBA pipeline is, is the SLI submission. Uh, so there's an opportunity there. Do my colleagues on the board have any questions? I do. So I can go first if you know. I do. Please. I have questions both for Bristol Plymouth and for the taxpayers, the town of Dyke. I want to preface my remarks by saying I do not have a problem with the quality of education at Bristol Plymouth Regional Technical High School. I started my teaching career there. But what I do have a problem with is the cost of this project. And as Mr. Reynolds mentioned earlier about needs and wants, and just as Bristol Plymouth has needs and wants, so don't the taxpayers of the town of Dighton and the children of Dighton who don't attend Bristol Plymouth. I have asked BP if they really need a new baseball field or a softball field, or a football field, or if they really need to move the school's location to a spot that is more visible to Route 24. I have asked if it would be more feasible to remodel a school, and I want to remind the taxpayers of the town of Dighton that it is not the school committee nor the board of selectmen who determines what the cost and payment of the school. It is the taxpayers of the town of Dighton and those representatives of the FinCon. We make recommendations. We do not vote. You vote. I also question why Bristol Plymouth doubled the size of their student population, even when safety and educational recommendations were questioned. When we talk about needs and wants, I have to ask the taxpayers of Dighton what they want. Do they want the overcrowding and portable classrooms at Dighton Elementary and Dighton Middle School to continue? Do you want us to continue to patch and repair Dighton Rehoboth Regional High School that is over 10 years older than Bristol Plymouth? Do you want to see the Dighton Library Building Project postponed once again as it has been for the past 25 years. Needs and wants. And we already have had overwhelming phone calls complaining about the current tax rate. You realize it is only going to go higher. Do you want our firefighters to continue sleeping in offices at the South Fire Station? Or have to continue to put up curtains or leave the area so female firefighters can have some privacy when they need to change, or have to go home to take a shower because there are no showers for the firemen at the South Station. The question to the taxpayers, do we need or want a new fire station? Dighton has many needs and wants. It already has a very high tax rate, and it is clear it will even go higher with all the projects that need to be completed. I asked the taxpayers of Dighton, tell me what projects that you want us to fund or not fund. I want you to seriously think about the needs and wants of this community when you vote on March 5th. Thank you. Do you have any questions uh, for BP? Yes, I, I would like to know, we, we talk about overcrowding at Bristol Plymouth, yet you continue to increase your roles knowing you were overcrowded. You, um, I'm curious an answer about that. Um, I was, like 
answer that question. Okay, then. thank you. Can someone answer that thank question, you. please? Sure. Um, I, I guess you've attended, this is my seventh year, and in seven years I have not increased the plus plus minus uh, as far as enrollment goes. But I also want to remind Dighton, um, about 10, year, 10 years ago, they did come into our district, uh, they didn't pay anything, nothing for this building, but they came in and we allowed, you know, we increased it for Dighton um, for that. So I just want you know, be aware, I have not increased the, the numbers um, you know, again, plus minus here and there, but the 13 has been the range that we've had and accepting that we were homeless at the time coming in after the building was already paid for this old building. Uh, for the last 10 years, I think it's been a good deal and, and it, it allowed your students to come into our, and, and we're very happy with Titan, happy with Rehoboth, and we're very happy with our relationship with now in our town. But I just want to remind you, those numbers have been increased since I've been there. Thank you. Any other questions? Just like my help. You mentioned earlier in regards to access to Bristol Plymouth and working with the district. Uh, what steps has Bristol Plymouth taken to work with Dighton Rehoboth Regional High School to accommodate those students that haven't come in as far as opening up courses or granting permission for cor uh, courses that may compete with Bristol Plymouth in the vocational education program at Dighton Rehoboth Regional High School. I guess I have to ask you to repeat the question. I'm not sure I, I kind of lost, lost. It is my understanding that schools in the district cannot have programs in the vocational technical area that compete with Bristol Plymouth. But it's also my understanding that agreements can be made, developing a spirit of cooperation between the two districts. My question to you is, what has been accomplished in taking care of the needs or helping Dighton Rehoboth Help with Regional High School create programs to meet vocational needs of students that can't get into BP? keeping in mind that there are certain waivers that can be granted by BP for those students, or at least for that school, to have programs that compete with BP. What steps has BP made working with the administration of Dighton Rehoboth Regional High School to grant waivers and to work with Dighton Rehoboth? to meet the needs of those of students who applied there but didn't get in? Dighton has their own vocational program, so I have been, uh, I just actually signed a letter uh, of you know, agreement that they're putting a labor, uh, I forgot what the uh, shop was, but they are doing that. That goes, that's that, you know, that's a, a regulation from uh, the state uh, um, regarding duplicate programs. Now, what happens is, you can get duplicate programs that show the need of that within that industry. And I have not been contacted by Dan Robert at this time. Thank you. Welcome. Mr. 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 if I can. Yes, Mr. Dutra. Yes, uh, speaking um, about Mr. Hall with the programs at DR, um, I believe BP allowed worked the deal with uh, the principal at the time, Mr. Braga, who's now at the Aggie School, to start a culinary arts program. Um, that went into effect, and from what I know now, they couldn't get enough students to go into the culinary arts program, so now all that equipment is being used by the cafeteria staff. So I believe BP has worked with the uh, to increase or try to help them increase a vocational type program, but it doesn't seem to be accepted as well as students going to BP where they have over 13 shops, maybe more, and I'd have to look at my list, where the students have a great opportunity to learn vocational education 
get into the workforce, or go on to college as they would like to do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Say, do you have any questions? Yes, I did just want to make um, one statement. <clears throat> Someone here tonight had said that grant money is our money. That's absolutely true. Um, it is money that's set aside by the Commonwealth due to taxes that we pay to the state, the good old state, right? Um, so no one's disputing that fact, but I think what we need to understand is the choice is, will this money that the MSBA is offering gonna go to a school with Dighton students or is it gonna go to a school without Dighton students? Waltham, Fall River, we saw the list of the projects. So that's the choice. I can't answer that question. That's the question everybody else has to answer. I also share concerns about the cost, um, but my other concern, quite frankly, is to spend $137 million just to do the bare minimum and still have crowding issues. And if anybody, if any municipality knows about crowding issues, it's the town of Dighton. Um, we have them at the school. We have issues with lack of space for the library, which is why it's closed right now. Um, so I did want to make that statement, but I did want to ask, I believe it's Mr. Crittenden, what were the costs of options B and C? I know that you told us the price for A, which was the repairs, the base repair, which was 137 million, but did you have any costs for options B and C? I do, yes. Let me uh, just give me one second, I'm gonna pull those up. We used to have that slide in our presentation, we need to put it back. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> Yeah, I'm going to pull the little presentation up. Can we still be on the website? Yeah, it probably is. I'm sure there were more. <laughs> my other yeah. question, my yeah, other question while The new construction option chosen was the most costly, cost efficient option. It's loading right now. It's a little bit of a good file. A lot of that too is because the new construction option is the quickest to build. Some of the renovation addition options require phasing, and so that prolongs the construction period, which increases the contingencies and the general conditions for the contractor. Um, so the new construction was the quickest. And the reason we put it on the football field wasn't to have it face the highway. It's the only real buildable spot on the site with all the wetlands. Um, and the amount of fields that we need to fit back in. So we looked at a lot of different locations on the site for the new building and for the addition, and that one afforded us the most land reserved for green space and parking and roadway and workspace outside. So just add a little more info. I do have the numbers here. Um, there were three addition renovation options submitted to the MPA for preliminary design. Um, each of those three options for Abbey Arrows had the three enrollments, a total of nine different options. We're looking strictly at the 1434 solution, which would be an apples to apples comparison. Uh, one of them was $322 million, another one was $349 million, and then the least expensive of the options was $339 million, and that was the one where uh, we were only keeping the gymnasium and then flipping most of the new builds uh, on the back side of the gymnasium. So 339 uh, was the lowest cost of the three ad rentals, and we're at 305 for new construction. Thank you. And if I may, my last um, question is, is this a net zero energy building? I know there's a lot of different energy efficiency measures that you've outlined, which will clearly, if the project passes, save um, the district money, um, and they hopefully save taxpayers money in that regard. Um, but I guess my question is, it was never explicitly mentioned if it's net zero, meaning doesn't have any, uh, I don't know what the word is, uh, like effect on the environment, any any net output. It's yes. a great question. That's a question that we get. Sorry, Tina. I'm very quick and I turn it over to you. Um, so one of the, the easiest ways to accomplish net zero is solar, right? Um, when you have an MSP in front of the project, it gets complicated because the, some of the most effective solar solutions are eligible for big federal grants. Mm -hmm. um, the state funding agreement says very clearly that if there are any other grants provided for this project, then it comes off the state's grant. Okay. 
So what we do is we prepare these buildings so that they're solar ready. The roof is structurally loaded for panels. Uh, there's uh, conduits going up to the roof. And then afterwards, if there's grant opportunities, it doesn't reduce the MSBA grant. And I'm sure Tina has plenty more to add to that. Yeah, I was going to say about the same thing. And we'll also work with Taunton um, Municipal Power and Light Plant and see, you know, what they can offer us in terms of solar options uh, after the fact or, you know, maybe during the project, there may be grants available that, you know, with the new energy uh, climate bill that's been passed, maybe there's additional grants. But like Chad said, we have to be really careful because it is stated in our funding agreement with the MSBA that they do take any additional grants that we get out of their money. So right now, um, we're in talks about that. And we would love for the, the school to be net zero and reduce the operational costs. So we're working on it. And those are improvements, I lied, I'm sorry. Those are improvements that could be done after, at like some point in the future, if the district decided it wanted to do that? Like Chad said, we can make the building be you know net zero ready. So they could come back in after we're done and they could get a grant from the federal government even to put a solar array on the roof and you know the building could be net zero. So we're looking at every angle to do that. Thank Our you. goal would be operational costs as much as possible. Thank you. Any more questions, Dr. C? No, thank you. Anybody else in the audience have any questions? Ms. Hirschi. Jessica Hershey of Chestnut Street. Um, it's more of a comment, um, possibly for the taxpayers of Dighton. Um, I really would just like to remind the taxpayers of Dighton that um, you know I share your concerns with the infrastructure in our in our own town, in our own schools. Um, in addition to our freshmen, we have a sixth grader who was a part who who lived in the modular units for a little bit of time before COVID. Um, you know, so I absolutely understand that, and we share that concern. Um, as you know, we heard in the presentation that Dighton Rehoboth has not submitted any plans or requests, you know, like from MSBA, you know, like for any changes to infrastructure, you know, in several years. Um, that responsibility comes from our superintendent. It comes from our school committee to present to the town, and that has not been done. There are no plans at all submitted from our school committee to the town. And so if we're holding out our funds, you know, for hopes that our schools are going to be improved, that is much needed. It is years and years in the making. And unfortunately, we haven't seen that commitment from the school committee or our superintendent. Um, he's retiring. Let's hope that the new one coming in does something about it. Um, you know, like, but I just want to remind our, our, the taxpayers that there is nothing waiting in the wings as far as improvements to our school. This is a fantastic opportunity for our students. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hirschi. Thank you. Are there any other questions on anybody that's on Zoom? If not, I want to thank the representatives from BP for giving us this presentation. I think you did a fantastic job to explain to our residents. Uh, we have to make that decision as to how it's going to impact us. So uh, we'll have a, a vote on March 5th, and we'll see how that goes. So thank you very much for participating. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank you. So we do have another selectmen's meeting coming this uh, Wednesday at mm -hmm. six o'clock. We have an executive session at five o'clock. Public won't be allowed to come in, but at six o'clock we'll, we'll begin our regular uh, selectmen's meeting. So I want to thank everybody for coming and participating. And on March fifth, we have a very important, difficult decision uh, to make. Uh, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All those in favor say aye. Select and hold. Aye. Dr. C. Aye. And Campuchico is an aye. Thank you very much again. Thank you. Thank you.